Dobré dopoledne, vážené dámy, vážení pánové. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jan Gruntorát. I am former managing director of Cessnet and member of board of directors. And I would like to welcome you of in, on behalf of Infra CZ and Cessnet Association on this conference. We very appreciate you have found time in your busy schedule and came to attend the conference. Special thanks go to our colleagues from abroad who agreed to travel to Prague and uh, attend the conference and give a speech. Just a few words about Air Infra CZ. As you know, it's the common activity of three organizations Cessnet Association of Legal Entity, uh, Masaryk University, Brno, Serit SC, and Technical University of Ostrava, project IT4 Innovations. Activity was started already on, in 2020. It was initiated by the Ministry of Education and Youth and Sport on recommendation of uh, International Review Panel. And the goal is to, let's say, make closer cooperation of this infrastructure already existing in our country in order users see it as the single entity. Very important aspect is, of course, contributes to sustainability of the activity because funding is a very important part. So we are already working in that area for four years and we have, I think, much work to be done. At this moment, I would like to give the floor to Professor Matiska, who would like to say a few words of, of our, let's say, partner organization, Masaryk University. Thank you, Jan. I would like to join him uh, with welcoming you here at the Infra CZ annual conference. I am glad to see so many uh, people uh, sitting in this room. Uh, as Jan said, I am a representative of the Serit SC, the unit within the Masaryk University, which is part of the e Infra CZ, being previously an independent e infrastructure, focusing mostly towards a flexible work with the with the infrastructure, with the IT infrastructure. I will not take much of your time uh, today because we have a very nice program ahead of us. So simply please enjoy this conference. If you can stay the whole day, not only today, but also tomorrow where we will give uh, more detailed information about how to actually use the infrastructure. Enjoy the conference, enjoy the speakers and please Try to be active because we would like to hear uh, something from you and we would like to get a feedback during the conference after every presentation. And we will have a panel at the end to discuss things more extensively. So thank you for coming and enjoy the conference. Jan. Thank you, Luděk. And now I would like to give the floor to Vík Vondrák, who will address you on behalf of the IT for innovations, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jan. So also as a representative of another member of the uh, Infra uh, C CZ, IT for Innovation National Supercomputing Center. So I, I would like to welcome you here. Uh, I'm also very, very happy that uh, we have uh, so many people as an audience. And uh, I would just uh, only repeat what uh, my predecessor just said that uh, uh, we will be very happy if uh, the conference won't be just only one way information going from the speakers to, uh, to the audience, but uh, we will be really happy and we will really appreciate if uh, we get a really uh, valuable uh, feedback from you because this is something what uh, we need to know how as the operators and providers of the infrastructure, how uh, our uh, infrastructure works and uh, what you expect from it and, and so on and so on. So, Enjoy the, the conference and uh, see you around during the, not only coffee breaks, but also during, uh, during another, another social events and so on in the evening. So, welcome. Thank you, Vít. And now I will give the floor to Branjo Brancic, who will be chairing the first section. So, enjoy the conference and Branjo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. 
So without further delay, I would like to invite uh, Per Ester, uh, who is the director of the advanced computing at uh, CSC, Computer uh, uh, CSC uh, uh, Center for Science uh, in Finland. And uh, per, is, per will t will tell us about our about the Finnish approach to the uh, large research infrastructures. Some slides also, and the microphone seems to be working. See floor. Um, so uh, thank you for giving giving this opportunity to talk a bit uh, and. Uh, about the e-infrastructure in Finland and collaboration in Nordic countries. So I will talk, maybe focus uh, more on the infrastructure in Finland and what we have in common here with Czech Republic, also the Lumi supercomputer. Uh, and, uh, but I, I maybe less on the collaboration in Nordic countries, but I, I will tell you why. Okay, uh, next slide, or do I have a clicker here? Yes, I have. Wow. Uh, so, uh, I come from this uh, CEC, IT Center for, for Science in, in Finland. So we, as it says here, uh, just to tell you a bit about the organization and how things working, because I think that could be interesting with, since you have a, a similar but a bit different type of organization here in Czech Republic. So we are a, what is called a non-profit special purpose company. Uh, owned by the Finnish state, Finnish government, uh, to 70%, and the higher education institutions, which is the universities and college universities in Finland. So they have the shares, their 30% shares divided among them, uh, proportional to some uh, size factor that have been calculated in, in agreement. Uh, so that, that are the owners. And what does it mean with the special purpose company? So the Finnish government have a few special purpose company. And especially uh, we are, so to say, managed from the Ministry of Education and Research. And they have at least one other special company, and that is a, a horse training school or something like this. So very far from what, what we are doing. But for certain specific topics, they, they have addressed this company. So you see, we, we have a volume here, and that is our total uh, uh, sales, you could say, because how it works is that we sell our services to Ministry of Education, to the universities. Uh, and it, when it comes to this, what is closest to me then, the computing services, we sell that to the Ministry of Education uh, in a contract, yearly contract, and then we provide services which are free then for researchers at the universities. So they, but they have to apply for computing, for their computing projects uh, as usual, but that's a quite lightweight process for, for ordinary use. So uh, as of this month, we are 675 employees and unfortunately, or not, uh, they, they are not all working with uh, scientific computing. Yeah? <laughs> uh, we, uh, th we do, as you see from this slides, we slide, we do a lot of different things for, for, the, for the universities and, and for the higher education institutions, I, I should say, in, in, in general. So uh, if you look to the right here, it is very much focused on these things for, for research or to the left, uh, but on in the middle you have uh, so services for education, learning and teachers, sol solution for educational teaching cooperation and so on, uh, and uh, hosting services for some of the, these customers. We do hosting for Finnish social uh, records, uh, things like this, uh, National Archive a bit, and, and uh, a lot of, of various things there. Then we also operate, like uh, which is in in the uh, uh, Czech e infra uh, organization, we also operate the national research network, uh, and uh, then the the identity uh, federation and so on. Uh, but to focus a bit, and then of course the the thing that we have uh, uh, we have our in, in together here, the Lumi supercomputer that we host then, and uh, that we, we will 
hear more about this week. But in addition to the, exactly as with the Czech Republic, we also have a national uh, computing platform. Uh, and uh, in addition to the, so to say, common European one that we host, we also have a national computing service. And as you see here from the um, uh, uh, flags there, so these two system, two major systems there, Machti and Puhti, uh, uh, they are um, from 2019 and 2020 respectively. So you see they start to come to the end of life. And right now a procurement is going on for their replacement. So we, we, uh, these are the present systems. As you see here, we try to do a more versatile environment. And when this uh, procurement was do done, it was really the focus on data, how to, uh, to put data in focus, have a good and solid platform for researchers to work with data. And that is this... Um, uh, uh, Alas, the object store where everything is uh, around then uh, with, the, with the 12 petabyte uh, object store there enabling researchers to share data that uh, or bring data into the system, share data uh, with, with the, uh, the collaborators and so on. And the, though the object store you can't it's not computable data, you can't connect directly to the computer, but you have to move the data to a storage where you can actually make it computable. So uh, you, you have to have different levels of storage here. So as you see in the picture, there's fast parallel storage luster based uh, connected to, to, these, to the machines. So for those who have uh, uh, used Lumi, you see similar principles here that are, are taken. And I think it is similar to what, is, what you find also in the Czech system here around the supercomputers. Something that was also introduced earlier but put into real work here is that we see the need for various cloud type of resources. I mean, research groups and researchers that want to have software or want to actually deliver a service to collaborators that want to spin up virtual machines and uh, deliver something out of it or have it part of a workflow. So there comes the uh, CPOTA and EPOTA. EPOTA means it's a type of cloud in Finnish. So. Uh, that's all these names. We should have a, a list of uh, what these <laughs> strange names means. But um, and Rakti, and then it's also container cloud, and Rakti is container in Finnish. So that's uh, uh, very obvious for everybody. Huh? Uh, and and uh, then we also in at part of this we have this quasi an uh, Atos uh, quantum simulator. It's just a uh, shared memory system where you, you can run a quantum simulator. So and this has been a, a continuous thing with the uh, uh, that could keep a national computing service and. Uh, to say something about this, we also have changed the way how this is funded. Previously, we got every fifth, sixth year, a, or have to apply for the, for the ministry for an investment grant that typically then was 25, 30 million something. Uh, and uh, then it was the, the investment was done. It was investment was actually never, we'd never owned the machines as a company. They, it was owned by the ministry really. Uh, now this has changed, so with the present from now, with the present con uh, procurement, we now receive a, it is a reservation in the state budget that is now uh, going up to next year, it will be 9 million, which we uh, think will be the steady level, so 9 million per year. Uh, for, for investment and that gives us a bit more freedom so to say when and what and then we can upgrade and so on and make decisions how to how to do this uh, keep the or maintain the, the national platform here uh, so the present procurement will be there in the still in the range of 25 million somewhere that is on, ongoing right now 
And uh, how to run these machines, I think it also looks very similar. You could, of course, have the uh, command line interface. But now what is now popular is the open on demand uh, web interface, which we see is become e also popular by, by the hardcore expert users, actually, because you can do things. You can open your command line interface here. Uh, one thing that makes it easier then because you don't need to fiddle around with the SSH keys and so on. You can just open the, the command line interface here because you are logged in with your federated identity. And that that is, a, many people uh, think that uh, eases up the, the way how to make use of the machines. So just to give you a feeling for the complete service catalog here. So in this picture, if, if you can read, yeah, maybe but this is how we pre it is presented on our web, and you find the the uh, the, the uh, link in the in the corner there. Uh, so it's all the different services uh, that we provide for research, and uh, try to uh, gather them. And they also try to, I mean, the follow a bit or organized in the way of the research. Uh, cycle here, that you discover and reuse data, then you want to do compute and anal uh, analyze, and then you store and share during a project, various service for this, and then you publish and want to preserve the data, if there is some data that is really going to, for, for uh, 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 more long term, pre or preserve data for, 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 save it for longer time. And then, of course, it goes back to discover and reuse data. And uh, that, that have a set of services that actually fulfill all these uh, different aspects of, of the research cycle. And uh, for also important here, what uh, so funders and also users and the universities uh, are asking for, what are the researchers doing? So we collect, of course, all the statistics about the jobs and uh, what, what machines are used for. So on the national system, we use a unified, uh, uh, what we call a billing unit, that you can have uh, billing units for your compute on the various machines, your billing units that is consumed uh, on for storage and so on, so you get and when you get the project, you get the number of billion, billing units and that you can spend on these different resources. And it's a different cost in terms of billing units on what resource you are using and, what, and how you are using it. So that is, uh, uh, we, we now for the next, and we have had these billing units and they are, so to say, normalized to an old uh, CPU or something, so that, that there is a certain inflation here. So I think we, we have to, we are now doing an overall uh, of, of this system and, and uh, see how we can, maybe it's also a bit confusing for may, maybe to have the same unit for storage and computing and so on. But uh, let's see, we, we are looking into that now. Maybe do a reform there. But, uh, and just to show a, a short, architecture there of the of the system and some of the features here is that I mean the various organizations universities we can share more detailed organ directly with the universities they can go and see how much resources are they using is it uh, is their re researchers active and so on and and uh, that is uh, uh, so say something that is asked for and to note here, maybe um, that we, and then you see that there is a box here also for Lumi statistics. It also goes into this system. But there we use the more uh, traditional million uh, core hours or, or, or GPU hours. And you have the QPU, the quantum processing units here. And you see, because we already, we are now waiting for the Lumi Q machine that is soon coming here in, in, in IT4i and in the Czech Republic. Uh, but we also have a uh, now already now a quantum computer connected to Lumi from VTT, a Finnish research uh, organization, and there it's uh, you can see it's uh, the almost seven hundred sixty thousand 
quantum processing unit seconds on that system. We have a couple of projects running there actually, so it's constantly also statistics for that because that the organization that is owning that quantum computer, they want to you know how much we are using it and that's important for them too. So overall the landscape uh, and, and uh, so there is it is a very centralized model in then in Finland. I mean, we don't have any competition in terms of providing computing resources for the, the national uh, on, on the national level for research. The there, there are of course uh, computing resources in the universities in specific groups. They have clusters. They might bring their own, or have bought from research uh, funding their own machine and so on. But it's not any, um, not nothing provided on a national level from them, and we we don't see some of these systems we are even hosting, uh, are hosted in our in our facilities, and uh, so that is uh, quite homogeneous. And we have had some projects also try with um, building up competence around computing and so on together with the some of the university groups that are are very intense on this. But one other large um, collaboration is of course with various research infrastructures and uh, that are Finland. So like um, all uh, European countries now also there is a research infrastructure roadmap where we um, uh, all the, the infrastructures are listed and you, it's not readable here. But uh, for CSC, we are collaborating and providing services for, for a number of these. Uh, and we are actually hosting one of them at CSC. So we are the Finnish Elixir node and, and host that facility. We, with Clarin, for example, the research network, we are a technical operating uh, center. Uh, and providing services, and, and that is something that we have been doing for language research for a long, long time, the Finnish Language Bank. Uh, and uh, then we are part of, of the projects like the FIQCI, the Finnish Quantum Computing Infrastructure, uh, and, and so on. And one other thing that is on the list here, uh, in, the, in the bottom there, is Nordic E-Infrastructure Collaboration, N-E-I-C, or NAIC. And I was going to, to talk about this, and I had Nordic Collaboration there in, in, uh, in the title of the talk. And we have been doing Nordic Collaboration for, for a number of years, and we have a number of ongoing projects. But right now, uh, this organization has been, been hosted by something called Nordforsk, which is a common Nordic uh, research funder, you could say. that is, uh, There is a, a, a Nordic parliament, actually, that handles some common Nordic, uh, since many years, since the 50s, uh, handling uh, is a so say collaboration platform for the, for the Nordic governments, and there is also Nordic Research Council, and they have been hosting this NAIC. But right now, they have declared that they are not interested in doing that anymore, and so right now it is a bit up in the air how this will continue. The present ongoing projects are are fine and funded and will continue. And one of them is, is important for us also together because we are working there with uh, how to connect and the, the software stack between HPC and quantum computing uh, services. So, so, but that is, that is safe, so to say. But right now, this collaboration is a bit shaky. And I hope in a couple of months be able to tell how it will proceed because it, it will proceed in some form, but not hosted by this, the present organization. But it, it has been built so that the research councils of the Nordic countries have pulled together a funding, a yearly, a yearly sum that uh, in total was around 2 million euros uh, that has been spent on, on uh, various projects. So the effort, how, how am I doing with time here? I'm not sure what uh, someone was supposed to signal to me, but uh, yeah. Uh, I go on until you kick me out. 
So I, I can't resist to talk a bit about Lumi, uh, because I hope uh, we have some Lumi users here and uh, to give a, uh, a bit update. So uh, for, and I think that is one of the six really big success stories that we have together, and the formation of the Lumi Consortium, where we now 11 countries together, and, uh, and then with the European Commission, uh, as the EuroHPC joint undertaking have come together and, and operating uh, the system that we, we host uh, in, in the CEC facilities in Kayani. Uh, and, and if you compare, we have now a number, we have the uh, Leonardo in Italy, we have uh, Mare Nostrum in Spain, and we will now get soon, uh, or let's say in the spring, next spring, uh, the, uh, uh, the the system in in Julish, uh, exascale system there Jupiter, and then we'll follow by a French system. But if you look at this other system that is more focused to one country, it it is for that, and of course for all European use. But through the collaboration here with the large number of countries, I think we have got a much more spread and active use and knowledge about this system, how what you can do with such large system uh, among researchers in, in, in our countries yeah, uh, around Europe. And that is uh, a, a very good uh, achievement, I think. And this has really formed a, a big ecosystem with, with collaboration among the, the, the Lumi Consortium partners and uh, with a lot of different uh, activities and uh, of course, we see a lot of different research that has been has been done on Lumi during this this first period, uh, and one thing that we have been mo much more than we thought and than we than anticipated is, of course, with the uh, large foundation models, large language models, and uh, that I know also is a big interest here from Czech Republic and and uh, ongoing work here. And also what we do with Lumi is that it's available for industry. And uh, there we also see an interest uh, with a number of projects. We, especially from, from the Finnish side, we are 20%, up to 20% of our uh, Finnish part is available for industry. And we, have, we are working with this. And for us, this is a new thing. We usually from CEC didn't work so much with industry. And uh, that that uh, is a uh, also works well in a good collaboration with these uh, European competence centers that we are are having together. So uh, well, you know about Lumi. It's an HP Cray EX supercomputer, and uh, one have to be reminded that the the, uh, the size of the system it's 380 petaflop. It's basically uh, exascale it, or it is exascale technology. At the same time as Lumi was installed, uh, the Frontier system in the Oak Ridge, uh, US, uh, Department of Energy Lab, exactly the same technology was installed and that was the first exaflop machine. So what we are dealing here with is then, we are about uh, one third of an exaflop here uh, or more uh, and um, it is exaflop technology. And one should remember, and I, I show this slide, uh, slide because it's a heat map of the top 500 systems in the world. Just to give you a feeling for how much bigger this, the, the largest systems are. So this is from the latest top 500 list with the uh, frontier in, in, uh, is number one there. And the green area is uh, US, the red area is, is Europe, and the blue area is, is uh, Asia. So when we introduced Lumi, it was number three on this list. Then it was Frontier, Fugaku, and Lumi. Now, two new systems appeared after a year, a uh, half a year in, in, uh, in the US, or after, yeah, half a year. Uh, and, uh, uh, but still, you see the size of the largest systems and why they are, so to say, in a leading league apart from the others. And it means that it, there is a lot of complexity in these systems on many levels. 
So if you look on Lumi, all the different uh, partitions that are there, we have, of course, in, in the upper right corner here, the Lumi GPU section. That is really where you get the performance, the, all the 380 petaflop. But remember, there is also a, a, a classical CPU partition, and it's only 262,000 CPU cores. Yeah, uh, It's not a small system, but it's still not so to say, included in the top uh, to get the, the, the peak performance or the, this peak performance numbers. And then the uh, over 100 petabyte of storage here that comes in various flavors like the others, uh, like we discussed before, it both luster storage and, and object storage here. Uh, fast parallel stories and object stories in different flavors. And uh, then coming soon, and we will hear more about this, uh, the Lumi Q. So I will not uh, uh, spend uh, time on this, but I think we had a very good uh, discussion within the consortium on uh, what the role of quantum computing and HPC here and see it as a, a complement and accelerator of, of HPC. So I finish with this slide just to give you a, a feeling then for the complexity. So what you see here, if we go from the lower uh, left corner, that is one in the Lumi GPU partition, that is a GPU blade, so it is a, a, a CPU there. And then there are these uh, four AMD uh, 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 GPU cores, or which have a G two GPU dies per each of them. And these are connected then to the switch that uh, is then uh, with, with um, uh, the, a number of nodes for each switch. So, th and, and uh, this, this is, um, uh, these switches are organized in groups, and you see uh, the size of these groups here, uh, and, and uh, just a few groups, but it's in reality it's even much worse with Lumi with 24 groups and uh, each of 124 nodes. Uh, and if you do the math, you can see that, that it works, calculates back. So it, it is a lot of complexity. It is a lot of cooling that is needed here. If you open one of these nodes, you don't see much electronics because it's all covered <laughs> with, with cooling equipment around this. And, uh, and uh, so the system generates a lot of heat. And that is another th as, uh, issue that you have to deal with. And what we are doing now with Lumi is that we can take the HPC load, uh, and that is now, so to say, warm water cooling with about uh, 30, 35 degrees that goes in and cooling. We lift it up to 44 degrees that we then use heat pumps to lift it up further to 80 degrees, and that is warm enough to be delivered back to the district heat system. So that is used to heat up the, the city of Kayani, where our data center is, and uh, that uh, then we can deliver back cooled water here. We also have the backup of dry cooling for, for this. And it means that we actually, the heat reuse factor is 57%. So 57% of the energy that we, we uh, the energy reuse factors, 57% of the energy is delivered back and can be reused of, of what we have. So that is a, a very good result. And uh, I think we, we uh, uh, can show that this is possible. But one need, I must stress, one need to have a business model for this because it is extra investment here to get this working in terms of heat pumps. So what we are doing, we sell this heat back to the city huh? or to the city energy company. And you, so in that can make a good uh, investment on that. Okay, I, I quit here and uh, remind about, we ha there are more slides you can find in this presentation. And as with other systems, Lumi is, you can use both the command line interface and there is also now a web interface for this, that is nice. So that is what we are doing, enabling top research and scientific breakthrough and I'm very happy that we can do this together. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Per. I think it's uh, very insightful to see what the computers, uh, what the CSC is doing. C the Finnish CSC is basically a direct counterpart of the A Infra CZ. Uh, so it's very good. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. I think we have two questions online, but I would first take the direct questions. So uh, we have here a question that goes, uh, uh, if I take the, how do you see AI change computation needs for the researchers? So we already see a number of projects where you combine, uh, let's say traditional uh, HPC simulation with AI in terms of typically selecting, uh, let's say the, the simulation space that you, you should, or the, or the compounds that you should investigate, for example, in, in, if you look in material science. A lot of these applications are, are, are already really there. And uh, it will, we will see really much more of this. That is what this kind of, uh, so to say, accelerating a bit where you go. And we see that you can do it with quite good precision and, and uh, good results also. So as a method, and it has been there for, for many years. I mean, we see a boom now because of these language models and so on. But we started our uh, AI group, which started uh, in 2013, uh, supporting, setting up various tools, and I think you will hear a bit more about it tomorrow in a talk also, setting up various tools around AI as a method for, for supporting uh, scientific simulations yeah, and research. We have there one more question, but uh, the, the question goes, who is participating on Lumi from Czech Republic? Uh, maybe that's more question to yeah, me. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> you can answer. <laughs> than, than to you. Uh, yes, uh, the Lumi uh, supercomputer is available via the open access calls uh, that are run at IT for Innovations. There is number of users. Uh, it's a low. It's basically tens of projects that are already running. In addition to the regular, we, are, we were also opening uh, kind of a special access calls where we were inviting uh, users from Czech Republic to access uh, the Lumi Consortium and the Lumi, uh, Lumi Supercomputers. I have to say that we still have free space on the Lumi G partition in particular, so if you feel you would like to use these uh, computers, please uh, apply. Uh, the calls are more or less open all the time. There is uh, one last question. What kind of improvement can we expect in HPC by mixing quantum and traditional computing? Okay, yeah, we, we, we can discuss this. <laughs> we discussed a bit on the breakfast, yes. actually, <laughs> what, what can be done. And uh, th there are several uh, interesting things here. I mean, we from the beginning, we have, as we di discussed, we see uh, quantum computing as a accelerate to certain aspects of, of HPC and uh, that you can uh, so take some uh, part of a problem into the quantum computer, get the result very, very quickly and also very energy efficiently, uh, which will over time here, I think, become an even more important aspect of the, of the whole thing. Uh, what we see now, it also raises a lot of interest from physicists that can, so to say, put together quantum study, quantum systems that you can put to, to live and experiment with in a quantum computer. Not the actual computing, but study the quantum system as itself that you can construct. So there are many, many different things here. And optimization problems looks promising, of course, in, as, a, as a topic. So with that, I would like to thank again Perester uh, Finnish. Center for Scientific Computing. Thank you. And I would like to invite next speaker, Paul Roos, who is uh, uh, Chief Community Relations Officer at uh, Giant to talk about the changing roles of NREN. Uh, Paul, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to Jan and uh, the committee for inviting me here today. Uh, and thank you for arranging such lovely weather as well. It feels like the first experience of summer coming here to Prague as well. So beautiful conditions. 
Thank you. Um, first of all, I've been invited to come and talk to you today a little bit about the changing landscapes of, of the NREN, uh, and hopefully you'll be more informed at the end of the presentation. But I thought I would start by, first of all, just explaining my capability. Oh. Do I sound better now? Okay, thank you. Um, I would explain, first of all, my credibility, why I'm here, uh, and a little bit about the Jean organization. For some of you, you may know Jean very well, and others, it might be your first experience of, of Jean and the NREN community. So I'll start, first of all, by just explaining who I am uh, and the organization I come from and how it fits into this NREN ecosystem. So Jean, as an organization, is about 160 employees. We're based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, but we're a membership organization. Um, we ourselves are called a regional education network, but we are made up as a membership organization of national research and education networks. Jan made a plea at the start today to make this an interactive session, so I'm going to have some forced interaction now. As an incentive, there is a chance for you to win a prize. I come equipped with some small pin badges. So my first question to the audience is, excluding those that sit on our General Assembly of Jean, so, Jan, for all the years you've served there, and Jakob, please, you're not allowed to answer. How many NRENs make up the Jean Association? Anybody willing to be brave and, and give me the first answer? Okay. One second, they could have a winner here. We come with prizes. I need to be quick. 28. 28 is a good answer. Have a badge. Any advances? Come on. Think of Europe, 27 countries. It's more than 27. We're bigger than the EC. Any advances, Jan? You're not allowed to answer. Sorry. 35. Very close. Have a badge. OK, we'll put you out of your misery. It's 38. And with that magic answer, we unlock the slides. So there are 38 national research and education networks that make up this membership organization. There's a slight anomaly in there that we have more. Uh, you've heard from Pear this morning. Pear comes from part of the region that's serviced by Norginet. We describe those as another regional network like Giants. This is in the Nordic. So we have 38 plus NREN, uh, plus Norginet that have five NRENs behind them. Here we are. This is what it looks like in, uh, in a footprint. So pretty extensive coverage of Europe, how those NRENs map. But they're not all the same. There's quite a lot of change and variation across these NRENs. And in the journey today, I'll tell you a little bit more. So the final interactive question, which country has the smallest NREN and how many staff do they have? I mean, I've got three more badges. Quick fire answers. I'm coming over to this side of the room. You don't have a choice. I'm going to put the microphone in front of you. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe two. Exactly, two staff, and which country have two staff for their errand? Malta. Oh, you're keeping me fit this morning. <laughs> Malta. Begins with an M, that's a correct, very good guess. Not Malta. Come on, the final badge, who wants it? There was a voice. Not the Vatican, no, but was pleased to see the Pope out travelling. Please pass it down, thank you. Oh, I need a chair up here. It's Montenegro. They're the smallest of our membership, but nonetheless important as part of this overall membership. Today, it's about the e-infrastructure conference. And I just wanted to paint this picture here and this slide to describe how Giant sits in this ecosystem. And when I say Giant, I refer to Giant frequently throughout the presentation, but Jean is about the NRENs as well. It is this community, but we here work to deliver services or we're part of the governance body. So if you take EOSC, for example, still recovering my breath. In the EOSC Association, Cessna is a mandated member as part of that governance. Jean sits on the governing board. So we're very much a collaborative exercise and work closely in delivering services or governing or participating in all of these groups. In a simplistic way, when you think about what I shared with you today, I would like to think, ask you to think of three dimensions. Network, services, and people. 
Um, my colleague from Jount, Mian's here with us today, and he has a presentation later. So I won't talk at length about the network because Mian will tell you all that Jount's been up to there. But simply to say, it's a very high capacity global reach network. And through the NREN network and infrastructure, the level of accessibility to support and service research and education users is second to none. The ability to provide a network path from Montenegro with its two employees all the way to the outback in Australia can happen very easily. We have the infrastructure, we have the collaboration with our partners, so there are NRENs, regional networks all around the world as well, that through this ecosystem we have a high capacity, highly available network. Mian will tell you more. Of course, it goes without saying that CESNET then interconnect with that network, having their own national network, but very much they interconnect and access this global capability. Just recently, CESNET have upgraded to 2 times 200 gig interfaces into the Giant network, and we expect that to grow in the future. As we see the demands for e-infrastructure growing, for hyper-connectivity, terabit capability, our network is ready, the backbone is capable and ready to support that future demands. I'll close the network chapter. Let's look at services. A few things about services here is that we really do operate services at scale. And again, there's variation. So in some instances, we have a national approach. And in some instances, we have a pan-European approach. So I think CESNET, many of you may be familiar with a video conferencing service that CESNET run. Is it per run, I think you call it here, is, is the service? And there's a, a European service, which is very similar, called EduMeet. So with the effects of uh, the pandemic and the requirement to educate, remotely work, alternatives to commercial platforms like Teams, like Zoom, our community have appropriate solutions that we've offered in that portfolio. And we're very much doing this at scale. Eduroam. Hands up around the room. Everybody know Eduroam? Had the benefit of travelling, accessing resources, so you can use your same credentials to access Wi-Fi networks where they're advertised. 7.5 billion authentications have happened on Eduroam since it's been implemented. Obviously, I've got that data from a few months ago, so we're probably trending upwards north of that. But that's a huge number and a really great measure of success for what our community have put together by way of these infrastructures. We operate in a, in a whole portfolio of these services, and I'm going to take a moment just to, to drill down as a, a case example here, because I was invited to talk about how things have changed. One example is in the area of cloud. Uh, we've heard about the great infrastructure that our community makes available from Pear's presentation, the whole Lumi infrastructure and the services and resources. But equally, we've noted that there is a demand from researchers, this community, to access commercial cloud services, infrastructure as a service. I'm not an expert to be able to say why is that better, is that worse, but there is a demand for it. But ensuring we access those, cloud commu those commercial cloud services they can be cost prohibitive. They may have unattractive terms and conditions around them. So we wanted to come together as a community and make sure that we leverage the economy of scale, the strength that we have by working as one to access and put in place low barriers, easy adoption to cloud services, these infrastructure services. So back in 2017, we came up with this idea, let's do this cloud framework. A lot of us are subject to public procurement overheads with the money that we receive, and that can be an onerous undertaking itself to actually spend the money. So we came together as a community and said, let's do one, one, one procurement, let's do this framework, and this framework would take away the overheads for everybody to make sure that they're accessing the right sort of suppliers. So you can spend the money and know that, tick, your finance and your audit people will say, yes, that's, that's a fine way to spend the money. But more than that, We've ensured that through the, cert, the infrastructure and our capability, the interface with these providers exploits our maximum strength. So for example, ingress and egress fees. Our networks are highly capable. We shouldn't be paying to move the data between our network and the, the commercial cloud providers. We're covering a lot of that infrastructure cost. There's no incremental cost. So in the negotiation, we sat down with the providers and said, hey, take that off of your bills. We're not paying that. Furthermore, some of the detailed legal terms and conditions around data sovereignty, certain types of data needs to be housed within national boundaries rather than in any other location. So we ensure that we have full visibility of, for researchers when they use these frameworks about where they store their data. And look at that story there. 
2017 from an initial idea from our community, should we access commercial cloud services? Yes, let's try it. We've gone from zero to 100 million a year consumption in 2023. That's across all of those membership, those, all those bodies that you saw there. But it just goes to show the sort of scale and the, the journey that we go on as a community. My colleagues asked me to add this one slide as a sales pitch for you. There is a final addition. These frameworks are coming up for renewal. We're out to tender at the moment. Um, and down at the bottom left there, you can see the forecast value for this continued growth. So this is going to be an iteration of what we've done in the past because it's now very much part of our service portfolio and demanded by our community. I've said the word community many times, and this is the third dimension, this people dimension. And perhaps I've done things in the reverse order here. It's the people and it's the community, this network of trust, which is the most important part of our capability as an e-infrastructure. Whether you look at that as a formal or an informal basis, all of these things are true and relevant. I hope by the end of our time here together, I would like to be able to call a few more people friends. And it's that ability to pick up a phone, make a connection in the future and have a conversation to explore common challenges that really underpins and helps our work together. That's one end of the extreme and the spectrum. At the other end, we do absolutely work and collaborate on formal projects, whether they're EU-funded projects, whether they're commercial agreements. And I'll talk to that in a moment because we are seeing one of the things changing our community is this move towards interacting more with industry. And when I say industry, it's perhaps the, the changing characteristic of some of these other infrastructure bodies about how they distribute their funding, which is driving changes in the way we work together. Somewhere in the middle, a nice little uh, event that was done, well, not so little, just a few weeks ago now, we had a security days conference here in Prague. So representatives from our community all came together to share knowledge and experience on the topic of security. So this is a typical example here of the things that we do on large uh, as our collective group. Let's have a little look at some of the, the NRENs here. This first slide, I thought if, if you opened up uh, one of the directors of an NREN's book, or their, their diary, or looked at their inbox, what are the sort of issues that they're considering? What's taking their time and attention at the moment? It will vary, of course, whether it's the, the small NREN or the large NREN, but these are the factors that are real and present at the moment. So how are our community changing and evolving to respond to this? Let's continue to the Nordics again. We'll make sure we represent other NRENs as well. But in Norway, they've gone quite, undertaken quite a journey there. SICT is the Norwegian NREN. They recently integrated uh, two organisations together. And the key points in here is they have a much broader responsibility. Their activities are around digital transformation. Okay? And that goes uh, for the education research sector, but is also broader. So as a, a sound bite and a quick look at this, this was Uninet the predecessor of SICT in 2021. If I go quickly, those with sharp, good visual memories will see the two main changes there is their service portfolio and number of employees as being the two change factors and the distribution of where those staff are. So we have to recognize these organizations are growing pretty rapidly to go from 100 to 500 employees, an office network across three locations rather than just one location. That changes a demand for management practices, different disciplines around service portfolios, certifications, ISO 27001 as an example, all become prerequisites to operate at this different scale and complexity. Let's go further south now. Let's, let's jump on a plane and head down to Greece. GRNet have undertaken a similar growth, actually. I've picked two examples here about NRENs that have particularly undertaken rapid amount of growth. Here, GRNet's traditional responsibilities for research and education is far broader now. Their portfolio extends to all of society. So they provide citizen services, digital identity services. The skills are quite transferable, but again, as an example of how a portfolio of our NRENs have changed, this one has undertaken significant variation. Now, if you want to find out a little bit more about our community, Jan operates and manages something we call the Compendium. 
you may have a need to do some research on this or, or understanding. The compendium effectively is a database, um, like a Wikipedia, where we ask our members to self-populate characteristics around their size, their dimensions, their business activity. So final couple of slides, let's just take a, a quick walk through about some of the key outcomes that we see here. So here's a sort of a typical output showing here around the variation how charging mechanisms for NRENs have changed over time. So here in Prague, the Czech Republic, we can see back in 2021, there was a flat fee based on bandwidth as a charging mechanism. We now have another type of mechanism. So there's a definite change that we see within our community. I'm not expecting you to digest this one. But again, this puts into focus the point I made about variation. This is showing how the NRENs connect different users. And you can see the different colors there, the proportion of primary schools, secondary schools, higher education, research infrastructures. There's a huge amount of variation. So not all NRENs are the same, and they have different challenges, different topologies. Services, let me translate this for you here. On the left-hand side, you can see the variation very simply on the, the line chart there around the, the variation services. So network services have seen the most number of growth, um, collaborative services of a significant amount of growth, professional services, some others storage and hosting, but nothing too significant that we're actually seeing there as a variation. And the darkest blue in this service portfolio are where most NRENs are providing their services. So here we are, Edurome and the core underlying network. Everybody likes to know about numbers. How big are they? How expensive? How rich are they, the typical NRENs? And you can see here there's an incredible spread. SURF, which is the NREN in the top right-hand corner there, have just received a significant funding program from the Dutch government. So what you will notice here is this is the 2023 snapshot, but the, the, the plotting of the NRENs and their position will significantly change over time as they look at different funding programs. I may not be Yoda, I don't have the power of the force um, at my control, but in concluding, there's a few th thoughts that I'd like to share with you. What are these forces of changing? What is driving the evolution of the NREN landscape? Well, one is a fact. NREN's e-infrastructures, we operate on a global scale. Whether that's out of necessity, because the sort of research infrastructure, uh, the S3 environment, is at huge cost. We can't all have a supercomputer in our offices. We have to share these resources, whether it's the square kilometer array spread across two continents. We can't all have these resources. We operate on a global basis. And interestingly, UNESCO cite from analysis that they've undertaken that the most successful piece of research, the ones that are cited most frequently, are ones that are done collaboratively. So it enforces, encourages researchers to work on this global, national, collaborative basis. So we're seeing this trend towards globalization, and we need an infrastructure and services to underpin those. The technical motivators, AI, we've had a question already in the previous presentation. What is the story about AI? Does it happen at the application layer? What about AI for e-infrastructures? Have we got a proposition there? I don't think we do directly at the moment, but we certainly know what's driving this is the underlying big data that drives AI. And it's our infrastructures that carry and support that data. So we've definitely got a role in that space. Unfortunately, we're all bombarded with the news of the world at the moment. Um, I think it's a bit of a sad time in our history um, with the instability, the conflicts that we see regularly on our news feeds. It is a reality of where we are. And we need to think about the contradiction between globalization and unrest. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we think about data as being important to us, what about sovereignty of that data? When we, uh, we collaborate and share and operate, who can we trust? How can we have end-to-end -end assurances, whether it's through our own infrastructure we're hosting and passing that data around, or whether we're using third parties that have undergone some degree of due diligence and control. We need to make sure as a community that we have that sovereignty, that we have control of our data, because it is an important and valuable resource, and we need to know whose hands it is at all times. I mentioned earlier the Security Days conference that was there. We do, unfortunately, on the network level, 
me and I don't know if you're going to talk about anything on security in your presentation. No, okay, we're going to avoid that topic. But I can say that we have seen an increased number of attacks, cyber attacks, and we need to be ready and responsive. And we have solutions in place to ensure that our network remains available and the services to deliver the missions for research education. And my final thought here is around this evolution of the governance and business models. I mentioned HPC as an example earlier on about the, the community in which we work. How they're funded and operated is this new way of being. Rather than a grassroots type organisation, we have member states, EC organisations that are distributing funding in a different way. They're using procurement as a vehicle to distribute funding. And then for us to collaborate and share, we have to respond in a different way. So we have to be ready to respond to public procurements ourselves and have commercial agreements, which compared to a, the way that we've, we've grown and evolved over the last 30 years is a fundamentally different way of working. We've seen our NRENs can change. We've had a couple of case studies there. And the reassuring fact is that we've built this, this pedigree, this background, this capability of trust, this community. So here's, here's some nice pictures. We host a conference every year. Um, this year it's going to be in Rennes, in, uh, in France. And there's some pictures of representatives from uh, some of our colleagues from all around the world. And the great thing is these NRENs, this global community is there poised, ready to undertake the challenges of the future and make sure that we sit in that e-infrastructure space and continue to provide relevant and valid services for researchers and educators. Thank you for your time today. I hope you've learned something. Here's my email address. I'm about for the rest of the day. I have a few more pin badges. So if anybody feels frustrated that they didn't win, please come and have a chat with me and, uh, and poise any questions you have. Thank you. So thank you very much, Paul, for your insights. Are there any questions? We still have time for, uh, for questions. I don't see. Do we have anything online? One last call. If not, then thanks again. It was, uh, it was a very interesting uh, contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Jan Haich to the floor, a professor at uh, Charles University, specializing in computational linguistics and the head of the LINDAT uh, infrastructure. So Jan, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, I, uh, so we have heard two presentations about the big HPCs and, and, the, and the network, so I'm stuck in between these presentations, which I still find very fascinating because I'm old enough to remember my first computer, which was eight kilobytes of memory. Rate. So you see how it grew, and uh, even though we, are, we do use, as, as I will say a little uh, later, uh, all, the, all these um, uh, facilities, I would like to show actually one of the use cases. In fact, it was mentioned already um, uh, here because uh, I will talk about large language models and the way how we are building um, them in, uh, in a European project which is called HPLT, High Performance Language Technologies. And uh, the, the goal of the project is to build both large language models and translation models. Now, of course, these things might become one, but at the moment we are building uh, both. So the project uh, is now sort of midway, <clears throat> which started in 22, will end next year. Um, the go the s there is a simple goal of the project is to collect data, textual data, for building large language models and also to collect parallel data for building translation models for all European languages plus some uh, of what we call this, the socially or economically important languages for Europe. Uh, the, uh, we, have, uh, we have been using the da data from the Internet Archive, so we have a contract with them. Uh, this is uh, a data which uh, are different from data available from elsewhere, like a common crawl or the various versions of it. Uh, so, of course, we had to work very hard to get this data in a form in which can be, it can be used, actually, for building um, uh, the, uh, the language models. Now, of course, one of the important points is if you build lang large language models today, you have to work with HPCs. So that was also um, uh, the reason why we, are, uh, con why we are using various HPCs, even though only two of them are actual members of the project, and that's Sigma 2 from uh, Norway and Cessnet or e-infra uh, from the Czech Republic. 
the other partners are experts in building both uh, large language models like University of Turku uh, and translation models, uh, mainly Edinburgh, Oslo, and, um, and us as well, uh, in a way. So uh, the, uh, the, the data is being stored at Cessnet and Sigma 2, but most of the computing is actually done elsewhere, especially for the actual building of the, of the language models. So the current status of the project is that we have downloaded about five petabytes of data from uh, San Francisco, and uh, we, we, are, we, we, have, we are working on the data. So there is a first version published, actually it's called version 1.2, uh, which contains about one third of the, of the available data. And this data has been used for building some of the models, uh, for just for the, um, for the idea how, uh, how um, well we can get reasonable text out of internet data. If you see it, we have from 1.7 petabytes, we have extracted about uh, 54 terabytes of clean data. 54 is uncompressed, the 8.4 number is compressed. So this is now available in 75 languages. Uh, it contains the original links, uh, just to be open as, as much as possible on those data. And we also have some small bilingual data, which will also grow uh, during the project. Now, uh, of course, this is internet data, and our biggest enemy in there is actually the copyright law. <laughs> and, uh, but we all know how it works. Like, so we are, we are fighting the thing uh, as everybody is doing. We are using uh, the new exceptions in the European copyright law. Uh, but of course, we still have uh, limitations in terms of how to share the data or what we can do with it. But we can certainly build the models with them. So this is uh, just a copy of the website. Everyone can go there and actually get, uh, get these uh, eight, petab uh, eight terabytes of uh, very clean data in those 75 languages. Uh, this is roughly the ratios. Obviously, English still dominates the web. We were slightly surprised that Russian is the third, uh, with Chinese the second. Um, but you see there, there, are, there are many, many languages uh, which we could identify actually reliably in, in those data. There might be more than that. So the, the results of the project so far, again in the, middle, in the middle of the project, that we have built small encoder-only models which are used by, usually for education, uh, for students in research projects, for building them in other applications around these models. These are monolingual models, uh, but when we, when we try to uh, evaluate them because they use in fact, much larger data than uh, probably the previous models, so they are better uh, than the multilingual BERT model in, uh, in for two-thirds of the languages, at least maybe more, and also better than the XMLR models. So, so, and they are also available both from our website and from Hugging Face, where we, where we have uh, an area just for HPLT where everybody can actually use the, the models. Now, this is a very small project, so no wonder we cannot actually build a, the real large language model, which, which would be, uh, which would be uh, competitive with models like Llama, um, even Llama 2, uh, not even speaking about the recent Llama 3. Uh, but we do cooperate with others, uh, especially in the north. And uh, so there are four, uh, there are three lang large language models actually now available as well, which were done in cooperation with others, uh, like Silo AI, uh, also Hugging Face, some other um, organizations, uh, even the Norwegian Library, for example, which cannot provide the data openly, but they can be used for the models. So there are three models. Um, the, uh, the FinGPT, which is a mixture of English and Finnish, which is a generative model uh, that's now available, the, the Nordic uh, set of language models, and also the very, well, not very large, but large Poro model, uh, which was actually uh, um, also combines Finnish and English, and it's a 34 billion parameters model. Now, there are two more in the works, and, uh, and I, I just point here, they are not available yet, Viking, as, as you can guess from the name, is a model also for the Nordic languages, uh, but Europa is a, just a working name for uh, where we cooperate with also many others like Silo AI, 
where we are trying to build a multilingual model for all European languages. This is now at the very beginning, uh, probably be only finished within a year from now, but it's sort of the a beginning of a, of a bigger story which we hope we will be able to work on in the future uh, by applying for additional funding and also for more resources from the HPCs where we will be able to actually build a pre-trained model from scratch also for all uh, European languages. But that's not part of the HPLT. There will, will have to be more funding and more time um, for, uh, for doing so. In fact, the calculations are such that, that for building a really large multilingual LLM, which would be sort of competitive with LAMA 3, would actually need uh, to use the LUMI as presented today for a full year to get 20 million GPU hours, the Lumi G uh, thing. So obviously uh, we cannot steal it, <laughs> the whole thing. Uh, so we will have to see whether we can uh, use and we hope uh, the new installations that we also talked today about, uh, namely the German uh, and the French uh, facilities. Uh, uh, unfortunately not hardware compatible, but hopefully it will work too. So. Um, as I said, uh, because this project was written two years ago when people didn't think that multilingual model will also be able to translate as well as translation models. In fact, they are still not able to do so. You have to fine tune them for a particular lang uh, language pair. But, but we promise to also do smaller translation models, especially for the low resource languages, which have some trouble when used in the multilingual LLM world. So we have done 16 language pairs with uh, with uh, you know, st strange but still European languages, small languages for which there is not enough resources, even monolingually. Uh, and these are now available from the Opus website, which was uh, maintained even before the HPLT project, but now uh, there are many more languages. And there is also all, all of them available on, on GitHub. So this is the website maintained at the University of Helsinki uh, and, uh, and the, the corpora and the models available there. Now, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, one of the biggest problems of the project was not to actually train or fine-tune a large language model or build the BERTs, but was to get reasonable data. And uh, apparently every project for building LLMs will have to devote uh, quite some time uh, for, for doing this. Now, of course, we have all, we have all kinds of attempts of getting good data. So probably you know about two weeks ago there was the fine web release of the common crawl data cleaned and packaged in a different way, which hopefully will be useful. But the Internet Archive data is still different. Common crawl, for example, doesn't go that deep in uh, when crawling the data. So if you have a website with some root uh, URL, uh, common crawl only goes, I don't know how many levels, but, but Internet Archive goes all the way to, to the depth. So some web pages you do not even get in common crawl. The other thing is that common crawl has limits, like one megabyte per page. And uh, so if you want to have a bigger, and you can imagine all the noise which is on the web, uh, pictures, headers, menus, uh, whatever. And then, uh, of course, it, even the recent data, or especially the recent data, where there is lots of graphics and other things, you only get a very small fraction of the web, uh, of the web page, whereas the Internet Archive actually did crawl the whole to full pages. So this is good complementary data, even though it's also from the Internet, as common crawl is, uh, and, but, but it needs a lot, of, uh, a lot of processing to get them into some good shape. And you have also seen uh, the, the reduction in size that from 1.7 petabyte you only get 54 terabytes of data. Uh, but uh, but we think that of course for the tech, for, for the purpose of building language models this is uh, this is good thing to do. Um, so we have various tools. I won't go into detail for both uh, getting the monolingual data, then identifying the parallel data, the translations of uh, from between various languages, mostly from English to the other language and, and vice versa. And in fact, uh, for the cleaning of the data, we don't need GPU yet. For actually for some tasks, we will soon need um, uh, GPU-based processing because some of the models that are used in cleaning the data, for example, for anonymization, where we have a name entity model, which works best if it's trained in the usual way with using language models, actually. So for those, we will probably need uh, more power. For the, for the moment, uh, this is all run uh, in Ostrava and in Oslo, well, not in Oslo, in Sigma 2, and then, uh, and then the data, when it's, when it's much smaller, is moved to Lumi, and then, then the, the models are built there. 
Um, so th there were there were many um, uh, steps in the data processing, which I believe were the first uh, that anyone uh, has attempted. Uh, such as new uh, language identification. If you get a web page and you rely on the URL, or if you rely on the information in the header of the web page, about 60% of that is wrong. So you actually get a language which is not the language that it seems to be, um, and you have to re-identify it. Of course, you have to do all kinds of other things which people did before, uh, but this is one thing which is, which is very important. Of course, they get the language right, because even if you build a multilingual model, of course, you put the idea of the language in, in, in the data. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then there are all, all kinds of questions, how to get uh, what, what we call the boilerplates. I mean, many web pages have, um, within, within one uh, root URL, they have uh, material which repeats quite often within the page. If you, if you look at, if you want to deduplicate, the pages still look different enough to keep, keep them both, but they have a lot of material which repeats in, in, these, in these thousands of pages sometimes together. You want to get rid of it, like all these foot, footers with uh, contact information and so on. So sometimes this is programmed in a very good way, so you can identify it very easily and reliably, but sometimes it is not. So that's, uh, that's one thing that uh, we will still have to work on it. And then uh, we also have to look at mixed language documents, which the new language ID seems to do very well, where you actually want to separate even within a document uh, the, the languages uh, one from uh, the other. So in fact, we now do language ID on a sentence level. So if you get our data uh, in the header of the data, you get the languages which are sort of the best languages for each sentence in the data, and you can maybe do some filtering yourself depending on the purpose for which the, the source data uh, will be used. Now, uh, I will just go through the rest very quickly, but uh, obviously if we want to share the data, we have to be careful, not only from the copyright point of view, but also from the privacy point of view. Now, this cannot be done um, hundred percent, you know, you know how that works. I mean, there is never ever um, completely anonymized document. So what we do, we do just the first step, the pseudonymization, by trying to identify names and uh, and mark them. And then if it depends on whoever is using the data, whether they they delete the full sentence, whether they delete the document, whether they replace the the name by some universal name or whatever they want to do, or some random name and so on. Uh, so for the moment in this data, we, we deleted the sentences just to be sure that it's pseudonymized, but we plan to actually do it in this more clever way so that er everyone will be able to do it. And that will be hopefully at the end of the project when we have this bigger data available, about three times of the current size, and we'll also have sort of the better uh, uh, cleaning applied and, and filtering. Uh, so for the for the moment, uh, what we own, o what we only promise, as many people do with large data sets, that if anyone complains, we will of course uh, uh, delete the data. This might of course make problems for repli replicability and other issues, but but we simply have to do it. We don't want to be sued of retaining some information that someone was in jail 15 years ago and now he doesn't want this, the world to know. Um, so so this will be um, uh, this will be. Um, uh, uh, done. Uh, the copyright issue will still remain a problem because we don't know whether there is any, any update of the copyright directive in the works. Uh, we are still far behind the, the group of countries which have much more liberal laws in terms of how to use copyrighted material like the US, Australia, Canada, Japan and so on. Um, and we would need to progress there but we are also trying to work with lawyers to, to do as much as, as we can within the current uh, uh, legal fr framework. So that's all about the project. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for the updates of the HPLT project. So please, uh, are there questions? Yes, we have one question here. Yeah, it is a kind of a, I say, uh, clearly seen by us a question. Well, but it is clear that you need a lot of computing power. However, I would like to ask you what else you think is important as provided by the infrastructures to the work like you did or similar thing, which are doing the AI and uh, this kind of uh, processing of data. 
from the infrastructures, we do need space because, of course, if we have, let's say, five times the amount of the original unclean data, it will be much easier to do all kinds of experiments with the data cleaning. Because it seems that actually, for example, someone asked us at the review of the HPLT project, why don't we do ablation studies? You know, what, which of the cleaning steps actually did influence the quality of the models? But imagine if we want to do it, that we would need a lot of space to, to have the copies, you know, with this step omitted, with this other step omitted, and then have different data sets, and then run again all, all the training and all that. So it's both space and computing power uh, that I think is needed. Thank you. Any other questions? How about the online questions? If not, let, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And uh, I would like to invite, uh, ah, here you are, excellent. <laughs> I would like to invite uh, Erwin Laure. Uh, Professor Laure is uh, head of the Max Planck Computing and Data Facility and is, uh, I would say, a long-term HPC veteran with, uh, his, who accumulated la I'm sorry for the word, vast, vast HPC experience. So we are looking forward about his insights about the developments of the HPC. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to Prague for this uh, very nice uh, event. And uh, I realize I stand between lunch and you, so I try to make this hopefully a little bit interesting. Um, we, we heard a lot about the infrastructure, the current status, where we are. Now let's look a little bit where we might be going, right? Um, first, where are we? Well, uh, Pierre has already said we are in the exascale era. We have uh, probably not the first, but one exascale system in the United States. There is probably a few more in China that we don't know about. And uh, soon we'll have also one in Europe with Jupiter that is supposed to be deployed in Jülich. So this is wonderful. Um, you see the top 500 list that you probably all know when you are in the HPC field. Uh, the middle line is the top one system that is nicely making progress in an exponential pace. Um, but what is interesting, if you look at the green line and the blue line, so the green is the aggregate of all 500 systems, and the blue is the performance of the number 500. So this, this is the bar you need to spring over if you want to be on the list. And you see that it's actually diminishing, right? And, and actually what is very interesting, we'll probably at some point see that uh, the top one system will actually dominate the whole list. So, so uh, I think the, the heat map that, that Bear has shown is, is already hinting to that. So it's basically the top five systems dominate everything. Yeah? All the rest is just small. So, what does this mean? Where, where, where are we going? Yeah? Is, are we still in the same regime that we will just continue and, and, and have larger systems? Well, top one maybe, the others probably not. Uh, will we just go to set a scale? Yeah? Which is, you know, after X scale, you have set a scale. It's very simple. Add a factor of 1,000. And this is, this is Intel. You see, it's a wonderful straight line to get this factor of 500 they put because we have a two exascale, uh, two exaflop system already. So, you know, we just say, okay, improve the architecture by a factor of 16. Intel knows how to do that. They will do. Improve the processing by five, uh, the, the, the process of, of chip manufacturing by five times, data movement, power, and so forth. Wonderful straight path to set a scale. Will that be the case? I'm not quite sure, but well, Intel will prove. Or will we just do what this man tells us to do? We do AI. Yeah? Forget about this HPC. Will we do AI? Or, of course, quantum. What will it be? There is a lot of these technologies out there. There's lots of questions about that. And some colleagues of mine, particularly Satoshi Matsuoka and Thorsten Höfler, 
have recently written a very nice paper that I can only recommend to you and have a look at that, where they talk uh, about these questions and some other myths and legends. So they identified 12 myths in HBC and, and I want to uh, discuss four of them with you which relate to my initial questions. Um, the first one I want to start with is actually application performance because this is what is most important to us. And so the, the, they postulate that application continue to improve even on stagnating hardware. Now you might wonder, what's stagnating hardware? Yeah. Top 500 list is still growing. Uh, you see these wonderful announcements from NVIDIA, from AMD, from Intel. Uh, you get a factor of 30x, 10x, 7x, 8x, 5x. Wonderful. Uh, look at the fine print. Is this a pointer? No. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, fine print. AI performance. Yeah? AI inference, AI training. NVIDIA is also talking a little bit about H HPC and says for some, maybe a factor 5, 6, 7x with the latest technology. There's an inconvenient truth. Yes, the chips as such, they provide you perhaps for some applications this 7x. But the chip, they do this by making the chip bigger and more resource hungry. So the, the net effect is actually very small. So in this graph, I show you the results that we have received from a recent procurement to build our new supercomputer. So the line one, so we have this relative to our current system, which is an Intel Ice Lake and NVIDIA A100 system. So this is the system we have in place since two and a half years. And we take as the, the measure the performance per watt, because this is something that we can clearly measure, and this is not dependent on economic considerations, right? Which price you get from your vendors and so forth. Yeah? But I tell you, it pretty much correlates also to the price that you get. And so, so this basically has all the, the recent technology. We have the, on the uh, CPU side, the Sapphire Rapids, the AMD Genoa and different SKUs, and we have the Ponte Vecchio, the MI300 from AMD, and the H100 from NVIDIA. So on the CPU side, you make perhaps some progress, 20%, 25%. On the GPU size, look at the H100, 70% performance per watt of the A100. I'm not gonna give up my A100s. I keep them <laughs> and I try to treat them well so they serve me for a long time because I'm not getting anything better, yeah? So only the uh, MI300 has shown a little surplus over what we have. Uh, you might get what systems we have bought. Um, I can tell you later. So performance, is the, uh, performance of hardware is stagnating. We, we, we live in this really unpleasant time. So we need to make sure that our algorithms are still improving. And, and David Keyes, uh, Thomas Schultz, they have put together some uh, the, the, the Moore's law of algorithms in fusion, in combustion, in, in meteorology. And basically you have every now and then you have a big jump up as new technologies kick in. Adaptive mesh refinement, uh, explicit solvers, higher order codes, and so forth, right? So I think this is the only way that we can drive performance. We need to have innovation and new technologies on the algorithmic side. Yeah? And much more effort needs to be put in here. But of course, that also means 
we need to refactor, rewrite a lot of the legacy code. And this is labor intensive and are we willing to do that and are our funders actually willing to do that? Is, uh, is an open question. Okay, uh, will we just run on accelerators? That's a little bit more tricky question. Where is this technology going? If you just take it from the, the different workloads, you can basically scientific workloads classify to compute bound, memory bound, or memory latency bound problems. And we started off the journey of HPC with our vector machines in the, in the 90s. Yeah? And they were good with memory bound problems and a little bit compute bound. And then CPUs have been taken over. Uh, they were used for, for virtually everything to a different extent. Yeah? Uh, now, basically, we have the GPUs yeah, that are taking over the compute bound and memory bandwidth bound. Problems memory latency bound, they are still on the CPU. And this is the dominant architecture that we are saying in, 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 in all the systems, including Lumi and, and, and others, yeah? But chip manufacturers are changing a little bit, right? We see the inclusion of high bandwidth memory and, and also vec longer vectors in the Intel Sapphire Rapids, in the Fugaku, the, the European processor, Rhea, will, will look quite, quite similar with actually, and, and the RISC-V with very, very wide vectors. So it might be that the CPU actually is moving into the memory bandwidth bound problems and we only keep the GPU for the compute bound matrix style uh, uh, computing. But this is unexplored. We don't know yet where this will go. And you might even think of a more crazy future where you have uh, CG arrays, coarse grained reconfigurable arrays that will take over most of it. And for those who are veteran as, as myself, you suddenly see this word PIM approaching again, processing in memory. So maybe this technology comes back. But that's, uh, yeah, really looking into the glass ball. But still, even if the hardware might not be just the uh, AI hardware, will we be doing deep learning and uh, AI everywhere. So this is a slide from Rick Stevens from, from Argon, who basically has shown that with the different AI technologies, foundational models, surrogate models, and so forth, um, you can basically do your whole scientific workflow. You can take the human out of the, out of the loop, right? From, from uh, hypothesis, creation, to setting up the experiment, running the experiment, uh, monitoring the experiment, we can basically do everything with AI. And we'll see a lot of that happening. At the same time, and I think the previous speaker has shown this, we, AI needs more and more resources. So we are now at this point where, oops, this one I wanted, where essentially AI is eating up as much resources as the top 500 is providing and even more. Yeah? Um, I think this is uh, probably a year old or so, so we, we, we are now already here somewhere. Look at all these announcements. The, the, the big hyperscalers are investing billions into their AI infrastructure. If you are waiting for GPUs, keep waiting. They all go to Microsoft, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, who bought 600,000 of these. Uh, this is where they go. And think of our investments, right? Jupiter is whatever, plus minus 500 millions. So, so, so we are small, yeah, compared to what they are doing. Um, and, and we see this now because previously it was small, right? So they had a free ride on the supercomputer architecture, but now they are really uh, taking over, which uh, at the same time comes with the problem that hardware technologies is following the market. So hardware technology is not following anymore what we need for the top 500, but what we need for large language models. Yeah? 
If you're still dependent on double precision floating point 64, your choices will be limited in future. So it's an inconvenient truth and future. Um, there was a question to pair uh, before, what uh, are people using for AI? And uh, incidentally, I put together a few examples <laughs> of what our researchers at the Max Planck Society are doing. And you have the very standard one, AlphaFold, right? It's probably one of the oldest and best introduced AI tools uh, that you use in biology uh, for genome alignment. Uh, so, so basically, what you, you, you can just run it, but you need to tune the system. You need to cope with the extreme I.O. requirements. You need to include faster storage, which is something that we have done on our HPC system, so this runs quite efficiently. Material science is actually a big user of AI in, in various ways. Uh, this is uh, an example where we use uh, a convolutional neural network uh, to reconstruct the, the 3D crystal structures from the tomography data. Uh, so in a sense, a kind of classical AI uh, uh, usage. This is a little bit more involved. So, so this is uh, a tool for deterministic symbolic regression. So it extracts uh, ex uh, mathematical expressions through iterative combinations. So basically, through regression, find a mathematical description on how to describe the desired properties of a material. That's a quite an interesting and involved tool. Um, but it's not only the analysis of what we know, we use AI also to create new stuff. Yeah? We use physically, physics informed generative models to basically come up with new structures that then can be studied. So you start studying the virtual stuff. Yeah? We do this in material science, we do this also in neuroscience. Yeah? Neuroscience, a classical thing is, of course, you use AI to analyze the brain scans that you get. The big problem you have is how do you train these models because you're not having that many brain scans and they are terribly expensive. So we close the loop, we use generative models to actually create <coughs> artificial brain scans yeah? and use them to train and so we can actually have then a better, larger model uh, to figure that out. And so that's, that, that's for me an interesting one because I never thought AI and astrophysics, but even in astrophysics, AI is kicking in. Uh, they basically use it uh, for, for, for the three day mapping of cloud complexes in the Milky Way. Um, so, yes, AI is at the moment being explored in many different domains. In most domains, it's still explorative. So production in some, and most of them who are in production, it's essentially image analysis. You have some, some sort of sensor, an MRI, a tomograph, or whatever, and you use that. Um, there is still a bit the debate about the black box approach of AI, which is seen critical, right? If you, if you are a material scientist or if you are a physicist, you, you want to have your model, you want to have your mathematical formulation of your model and not say, oh, AI tells me and I believe. Yeah? But there is certainly a very huge uh, potential to speed up tedious tasks, right? You prune the search space, uh, you're creating new study objects with generative models and so forth. And the question is, yeah, first principle simulations, will they be replaced? I'm, I'm not sure, but if they are, maybe the first principle models are not the right ones, so maybe they need to change as well. Um, but certainly, AI is here to stay, so we will see more and surprising adoptions of AI. Um, will we just use quantum computers in future? Uh, Bear has already alluded quite a bit to this. 
Um, citing another paper of uh, uh, Thorsten Höffler here. Um, I think the problem with quantum computing is we still don't have the killer application. First of all, somebody has said quantum computers are fast. No, they are not fast. They are very, very slow. They have an enormous parallelism. But the principle, I think it's in the megahertz or so that they are operating, right? and not in the gigahertz that we have on, on classical computers. So if you really want to have quantum supremacy, meaning that for, the, for all of the problems that the quantum computer is better, you actually need uh, exponential speed up. Yeah? Otherwise, you will always have see that the, the standard computer in a sense is better. And this is basically Schwarz algorithm at the moment, but even there, to, to really make it useful, we need millions of uh, qubits. And uh, what, what, what is it you're getting in Czech Republic? 20, right? Plus minus. You, you never know with quantum systems, yeah? Don't look, then the qubits are falling away. Uh, so, so there is still a big question. What is the killer application? But still, quantum computers, they may be very useful for certain tasks, yeah? They might not overtake all of HPC. I think this is basically, nobody is at the moment believing that. But they, they will likely be used as accelerators for certain problems in the classical workflow. And this is actually what projects like LumiQ and, and others in Europe and in the US and in Japan are currently uh, exploring. I think the, the, the other thing you need to think about is quantum computers are good on little data. It's very expensive and difficult of getting data in and out of these quantum machines. So for big data problems, we need to see. And the final questions I have on quantum computers, what will be the commercial viability of quantum computers? Will we ever see commercial quantum computers? There's lots of these startup companies right now because there is a hype on quantum computing and there is a lot of startup money in there. But I've, I don't know of any company that uses a quantum computer already in production. They use it pretty much as we in academia use it uh, for explorative things to try to understand the technology. So this will become a question, otherwise quantum computers might turn the path of standard physics experiments like a synchrotron yeah, and uh, you, you, you build it custom made for uh, specific purposes. So, uh, with this, let me, let me ramp up and, and uh, let you go for lunch. Um, there is a lot of hypes and lots of myths that we see in HPC and some might become reality, some might not. We don't know yet, right? I've given you some indications where things might be going but uh, nobody knows the future. Uh, what is true is that there is a lot more than today's hardware of flops fost exascale computing. But we need scientific approaches to that, to AI, to uh, uh, quantum computing. Perhaps neuromorphic computing is coming back. I was contemplating whether I should put it on the slides or not. I decided not to, uh, but we'll see. But be, be, be aware of the hypes, right? Don't follow all the hypes, but try to really do a scientific evaluation um, what is reality and what not. What is certainly reality is that the hardware development at the moment is dominated by AI. As I told you, forget about floating point 64, uh, yeah, GPUs, go actually as I, I saw people talking about floating point four, which is, which is very interesting, yeah? Um, so, I, I, if you wanna survive, if you wanna make scientific progress, be pragmatic and adopt. But who knows, we might actually also see the, the case where the HPC community is starting again to build their own chips and own systems. We'll see where this is going, yeah? But certainly the Commercial market is driven by AI, is driven by the hyperscalers. There is the money, there the market goes. Okay, with this, thank you very much.
Thank you very much for a very inf insightful talk. And uh, I hope we have, a question. we have questions. There is a question over there, but I don't know how to get your microphone. <laughs> but, yeah. I don't want to throw it, but. Yeah, uh, thank you for interesting talk. I am wondering about the example with brain scans. If you generate data by, by AI, you kind of conserve uh, what you already know. And then you are running in several issues. Like, did you get generated data correctly? Will it be perfect representation of uh, the real data? Do you have some kind of controls? And when then you see something very new, something interesting, will you be able to detect it if you compare based on this kind of subset? So I just wonder more generally if these super trooper uh, toys aren't just a hype and uh, by using it we are um, well, getting something but also losing something. Uh, I, I think you, you, you put your finger on the point of the problem of generative models, right? That they get into this uh, vicious cycle that they are just reconfirming themselves uh, at, at not representing reality anymore. Um, I think in, in this specific example, of course, it's not the only data that you use, right? You also use the, the, the real scans that you get, but you don't have enough, yeah? Uh, but in general, I, I, I want, uh, I don't remember who it was, but, in one article, somebody claimed that from now on, uh, AI is actually going to get dumber and not more intelligent anymore because the data that we train on is to a large extent already produced by generative models and by AI. Yeah? So there is, there is some, some risk in all that, definitely. Any, fur any further question at the other end? Uh, thank you. I agree with the statement that we should not just sit and wait for a um, bigger and faster computer, that there is a lot of potential in improving the algorithms and the codes. I know from the colleagues around me that uh, it starts to become a practice to use AI to write new code. And uh, I would like to know your opinion if you see some potential, for example, on optimizing existing legacy code uh, to new CPU architecture, if AI or ChatGPT, let's say, mm -hmm. can actually do this job for us. That's, that's an interesting question. Uh, we, we don't have experiences with that yet. We do use uh, AI technologies for mundane tasks or to get you a first version of a code. But when it comes then really to the correctness and to the performance, we see that still human intervention is needed. So yes, AI is a good tool to get you started yeah, and help you overcome some first hurdles but I don't think, at least in my experiences, we're not yet there that they can do things completely by themselves. But yeah, it's, it's a tool and, and, and I think, don't be, don't be afraid to use it, yeah? but don't expect it to give you a 100% a, a correct result. So you need to still, it's, it's, it's pretty much like uh, when, you, when you work with your PhD student, you need to check what the PhD student had been doing, yeah? <laughs> More questions? Any, any other question? Uh, do we have any question online? All right. So we are using to optimize our CPU and GPU architecture or uh, get ideas of new architectures. So, so that was a question. Are we using AI to optimize our CPU or, and GPU architecture or get ideas of new architectures? If yes, are there successful applications? Maybe I, I tried to read it pretty one much more time. what we discussed already, right? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Yes, I think that was that was already answered. Uh, let's have a look at the other question. If 
if commercials is buying most of the GPUs, is there a potential market gap for new GPU challengers, manufacturers, or is it dominancy of NVIDIA? So, there certainly is a potential. First of all, you see from a hardware perspective, AMD is actually pretty good with their MI300 series and, and, and future ones. We see the developments around the European processor, particularly the RISC-V-based architecture with very wide vectors. There we need to see how commercially viable it is. Yeah. Uh, the dominance of NVIDIA, I claim, is not because of the hardware they have, it's really because of the software ecosystem. So at the moment, and particularly if you are an AI researcher, yes, you can use AMD, but it, it's difficult. And in NVIDIA, you have the ecosystem and you get going and running. So, so uh, don't think of NVIDIA as a hardware-only company. NVIDIA is a huge software company, and they have realized that very early on and spent a lot of effort in, in tuning that and now they are getting the return of this, unfortunately, to us. <laughs> it's a monopoly. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. You have said that a code refactoring would be needed, uh, but the trends, is, trends are opposite. Uh, usage of different frameworks is in place. So how do you see this? Is well, yes, frameworks uh, are being used to basically put together your workflow, yeah, and, and perhaps put together different code components. But still, uh, if, if, you, if you want to solve a certain equation, yeah, you need to have the algorithm in place and you need to work on the algorithm to make it as efficient as possible. And perhaps rethink the algorithm also in view of, of, of new hardware lower precision, what does it mean? Wider vectors, what does it mean? Can I use that? So at, at the end, you see both. And, and yes, unfortunately, to some extent, we, we teach our students primarily how to use these frameworks, right? And you uh, drag and drop and uh, build your program by just com using the frameworks and combining bits and pieces. But at the end, somebody will have to do these bits and pieces, and there is where the, the effort goes. I can only agree. Uh, more questions? Is there any more questions? Yeah, please. Okay. How, how do you see the European activities in this field? I mean, compared to the US or Asian? Um, I, I think Europe has uh, made a lot of progress thanks to Euro HPC, where for the first time we're starting to have similar programs. Um, what we still lack in Europe is a kind of large-scale application refactoring algorithm effort. We, we, we see some of this, but not on the scale and, and impact like the, the exascale computing project in the US have been or what the Japanese are doing building their, their new systems. My biggest concern at the moment in Europe is that research into HPC technologies at the moment is purely funded for Euro HPC. And Euro HPC is funding production systems. So they, they work at a pretty high technology readiness level. Mm -hmm. So I don't see anybody funding the needed groundwork. Yeah? The, the research work that needs to be done with low TRL, where things will fail, some things might go through. We don't have this at the moment in Europe, and this is a big concern to me and others at the moment. More questions? All right, I don't see more questions here. Do we have anything else? Yes, there are new questions, and we still have a couple of minutes. So, do you think is it possible AMD will provide in foreseeable future enhanced software support 
uh, NVIDIA hardware tends to be expensive and <laughs> unavailable. Yeah, yes, they, 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 are, they, they are working hard. We are working with them uh, at the, well, uh, 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 Lawrence Livermore is just getting their big MI300 system. Um, they, 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 they still have a very long way to go. Uh, we're still lacking a working Fortran compiler, so just to, to mention this. <laughs> Uh, we've another question here is uh, similar to the previous. Uh, please comment on the role of frameworks in scalability and robustness in HPC. Yeah, I think we, we, we discussed, discussed this. Already, this uh, yeah. yes. All right. If uh, I don't see any more any more hands, so thank you once again. Thank you very much. And.